Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm a wet news subscriber. My, my wife can't believe it. She's a nurse and um, she laughs and I caught her secretly reading it a few months ago. It's a lesson in there somewhere. As Maureen said, I'm, I'm a civil engineer based up in Edinburgh and I love my day job. Never ever complain about your day job if it's doing this. Iowa, circa 1923. My grandpappy shoveled it before me. My son's going to shovel it. I hope the grandparents now have a more respectable role overseeing their kids working for Dynarod. However, in a country that in the last two years has spent 150 billion US dollars on weapon systems, not so funny when it's happening today, the lowest untouchable Dalit caste this chap, his name is actually Rua Ram. Courtesy of the BBC, we hunted out this image. You've got to love the marigold gloves, but what a job. Manually sifting New Delhi's sewers. That's in a country that's had more people in space than the United Kingdom. What a sobering thought. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. This is one of the only audiences I could say fog, and you would know what I meant. How on earth did that get down the sewer? I think we'll hear from Rachel, our final speaker in the afternoon, just about how we can nudge people's behaviours to stop that kind of thing getting into our sewers in the first place. Anyone recognise that? Like my students, they're quiet when asked questions and the front row is empty. It's a scary place, the front row. Personally, I think I should get a government research grant to track down and interrogate the original owner. How did that get down a drain under the highway in County Durham? By the time it was flooding, located, road excavated, pipe broken open and sewer reinstated, the bill to the taxpayer, £150,000. Not sustainable in any financial climate, let alone the mess we find ourselves currently in. But let's not get political. Common one, courtesy of Surrey County Council, mass ingress of tree roots. But therein, to an academic, lies a fantastic opportunity. Think of the nutrient-rich, constant 11 to 12 Celsius source of energy lying in that sewer. Imagine that, radiating heat to defrost the pathways. I don't know how far south the bad winter came, but the last two years in Edinburgh, my street has been waist deep in snow for four months. Imagine the heat we could liberate from that. No small animals were harmed in the making of this presentation. I showed that slide and a fellow from Scottish Water told me the biggest thing he'd found down a sewer was a deer. Alive, walking about, a bit confused and a bit scared. Large inanimate objects, he's found a television. No small audience watching it, it was broken. It should not have been down the sewer in the first place. We do a lot of work and the main focus in this presentation is on the physics of high pressure water jets. Here we see what I think is quite a beautiful image of a jet running free in air at 5,000 psi at a standoff height of about 5 millimeters from center of nozzle to the rails. Angle of attack in there, 30 degrees. It's a fairly standard WRC jetting test. The action inside that jet is fantastic. The science behind this cavitation. What happens is the jet goes from high pressure contained in a lance, we'll go back. Suddenly it opens to atmosphere. For a short distance beyond the nozzle, the jet still feels the effect of the pipe and the flue lines continue to contract. Thereafter, the jet passes the vena contracta, the squished part, sorry passes the contraction, re-expands in atmosphere, and what happens is water as a bulk fluid is ripped apart. Here we'd like you to think of the water not so much as a liquid, but as a quasi-solid. 
When you're sitting in the bathtub playing submarine commander with that empty beer bottle, the rubber ducks, you've done it. A few more folks smiling. You've all played submarine commander in the bath. You're paddling around. You're moving the water as a fluid. You are not compressing it. Try the following experiment to verify the solidity of water. Go to your local swimming pool. Gentlemen, hitch up the shorts. No indecent exposure. Climb to the 10 meter diving board. Curl your toes over the edge. It's a long way down. Fall forwards. When the lifeguard is pulling you out, remember water is a quasi-solid. With a bulk modulus of two gigapascals, it can sustain an enormous tensile stress. This is cavitation. As the pressure drop causes the fluid to expand, it forms micro-cavities nucleating around minute particles, suspended solids. The cavities then slam shut. Doesn't look that bad. We imaged a couple of bubbles collapsing as they approached the pipe wall, the inside of a sewer or a drain being cleaned. Here we see frames at two millisecond intervals, two thousandths of a second, going one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight. You can get the idea going across two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Doesn't look that bad. That's a single bubble approaching a horizontal pipe wall. See it flattening? And there's the damaging bit. You can tell how nervous the speaker is by the vibration of the laser pointer. I'll turn it off. The re-entrant microjet shows us the bubbles in a cavitating water jet do not collapse in a nice series of concentric rings. As they approach a flat surface, the wall of your drain, a microjet forms with a re-entrant tip. It then bursts through the back of the bubble and delivers an enormous impulse to the wall of the substrate to which it hits. That gives the jet an enormous cleansing power, at the same time gives it a disturbing ability to penetrate high tensile steel, solid clay, PVC, polypropylene, polyethylene, etc. From a purely physical point of view, the radius of curvature halves with every doubling of the time. The inward acceleration goes up with time cubed. So from 2 milliseconds to 4 to 8 to 16, we have seen a 32-fold increase in the inward acceleration of that microjet. We have seen its radius of curvature, its sharpness, divided by 8. And all of the energy of many millions of these bubbles is focused on the re-entrant microjets. Doesn't look too bad in a single bubble. This is why your safety card carries treat as gunshot wound if you have an injury with a high pressure water jetting hose or lance. You get the same effect taking a high velocity rifle. This is an experiment I've not been allowed to replicate in the university yet and shoot the sewer. Please do not automatically reach for the high pressure water gun to unblock your sewers and drains. In the hands of a maniac, these things are lethal. You can cause a lot of damage without a clerk of works, a governor, I don't mean the boss, I mean a governor as in a regulator on the pump, which can be easily overridden. This kind of technology requires supervision. It requires a simple visual inspection before you automatically reach for the high pressure gun. We were sponsored by a variety of bodies, mostly the pipe manufacturing industry, to examine the efficacy of various materials in their ability to withstand high pressure water jets at the 4,000, 5,000 PSI range, which would really be the market entry threshold for the UK, European Union pipes, drains and sewers network. Energized supply of water, a clamp, otherwise everything heads off to Copenhagen Harbor in about short order. Test sample, safety cage. These jets will go through bone like butter. Keep your fingers well out of the way. Backstop, again, to prevent everything heading straight out to sea. A spacer to set the standoff height. And the dangerous end, the nozzle, a standard WRC nozzle. 
We have a high-speed image capture system which can capture at around 50 microsecond frame interval what's actually happening inside the jet. Image analysis can strip away the supposed fuzziness around the edges and we can isolate the core of the jet and examine the frequency of the fluctuations we're seeing in the very rough edges. And the frequency of those fluctuations corresponds to the dominant driving frequency for vortex ring cavitation, where pulses of water will alternately expand and contract violently and rip out the bioslime and the blockages and the encrustations and the fog, but if applied incorrectly, will cause a great deal of damage to the wall of your sewer. We wanted to have a look at the kind of pressures that were actually acting underneath the jet. Simple pressure plate, and as the pressure goes up, we see readings going from 1 to 5,000 psi, and we see a negative pressure developing. That is the suction that will peel away the material, be it bio slime or the wall of your sewer. We plumbed in a slightly more accurate digital pressure transducer and had a look at some of the other vibrations taking place in this jet. It's a very, very dynamic multi-phase fluid flow. We found pressure fluctuations at two dominant frequencies. One relating to the actual vibration of the engine driving the pump, driving the water down the nozzle. Wavelet transforms also identified higher frequencies which we could characterize as not being related in any way to the engine, but related purely to the destructive cavitation of the bubbles in the flow. What we're trying to do is model this behavior in the jet to see if we could tune the jet to get the right frequency to avoid damaging the sewer while still cleaning the muck. What we're looking at is modeling the behavior of a bubble that starts from a nucleation site. What do I mean by nucleation? Imagine taking a glass of Coca-Cola and dropping in a sugar lump. What happens? Instant foam. Each grain of sugar is a nucleation site. A bubble can nucleate or a cavity can grow from something as tiny as a speck of dust. Out in fresh air, background solar radiation can even cause sufficient perturbation to allow nucleation to start at random. It's why we have a star on the bottom of a beer glass. It's the source of bubbles that keeps the head active. Beer, a subject close to my heart. What we're modeling is the growth of the bubbles, the slamming closed behavior, and their subsequent regrowth and cyclical decay. We were helped in this by a very, very bright chap, professor of physics out at Caltech, Christopher Brennan, who gave us a bit of advice on how best to model this. Start off with a dot, your nucleation site. Let the bubble grow and set up some boundary conditions for velocity of the bubble, temperature, pressure, surface tension, and viscosity, etc., etc. Let the bubble grow, and as it gets big enough, it becomes unstable. In a region of low pressure, a bubble that has been big will naturally tend to keep growing and growing until it hits something and then it collapses. A little bit of magic in between, and you come down to the rally plesset equation. That's the generalized form. Rally, as in Lord Rally, J.W. Strutt, English physicist, and Milton Plesset, working at MIT in the 40s and 50s, added a little bit more modern mathematics to this. The rally plesset equation is what is cleaning your sewers. We can add mass transfer and heat effects further refine it, don't bore you with the details, but suffice to say, the terms governing the bubble growth and the cleansing power, I'll put their faces up just to give them recognition we're due. There's a driving term. The driving term is the pressure you set in the lance. The pressure has to drop to atmospheric, so if you set the lance at 5,000 psi, your pressure drop is 5,000 psi. You have a thermal term. Thankfully, you can usually ignore the thermal term because the water you're flushing the sewer with is at a similar temperature right through the system. You have a pressure term, 
On the other side, you have your bubble growth term, you have a viscous term, and a surface tension term. Obviously, the more slimy a fluid is, the thicker the fluid. This retards and constrains the bubble growth. The greater the surface tension you can engender, the greater a size of a bubble can be sustained in the flow. The surface tension term may look a little bit obscure. The implications really come into play when you consider detergents, additives, and foaming agents, both in the sewer and as an additive to the jet stream to encourage surfactant or colloidal action as a cleansing agent. With these high-pressure jets, you can stir up an incredible amount of foam. I have flooded our hydraulics laboratory on several occasions, gleefully washing stuff down the drains, and it's foaming up the street half a kilometer downstream. You think, no, be very careful with foaming agents and high-pressure jets. This is not like the rugby club outing where you tip the fairy liquid in the fountain and run off home. It makes a lot of mess. I'm going to have to hurry you along, Charlie. Bubble growth, and we see a few different sizes of bubbles, how they grow and contract. What are the implications for your sewer? Here's a bubble hitting the wall. At its peak, the bubble isn't doing much. That's a turning point. The bubble's at its biggest, no real damage done. However, there are many different sizes of bubbles, all in different phases of the growth cycle. The orange-colored bubble is on its downward destructive path, and it's causing a huge amount of damage as it collapses. As it does so, the wall of the sewer becomes further away, and different bubble clouds take over the destructive effect, and it becomes progressive up to a point. What happens? You've seen these pictures before. They all get torn out the sewer. Great deal of damage caused, and it turns it to shredded wheat. Rips it apart. Rips out glass fibers, debonds them from the matrix. Broken sewer pipe. Traditionally, you can change the angle of attack. Most shearing action, 45 degrees, best cleansing effect. However, you try controlling that 100 meters down chainage, invisible, in the dark, in a pipe. Standoff height. I mentioned the destructive effect fades. As the pipe is eroded, provided you can keep the nozzle further away, then the diminishing effect of the destructive power of the jet becomes your friend. It now goes back at greater than about 30 mil standoff height to being cleaning rather than destroying. That sums up where we are. My last slide. Think laterally. We are short of energy. Some of these bubbles can be made to collapse so energetically they emit light. Two cycles of a bubble in glycerine excited with a horn antenna at 15 kilohertz. And for about 15 trillionths of a second, that emitted light. That's the star in a jar. It's a more achievable holy grail than cold fusion. It takes brighter folk than me. It takes physics professors to sort that one out. But in those high-pressure water jets, there's a huge reserve of energy. Thank you very much indeed.